Bueno, uh, buenas tardes. Vamos a empezar ya, porque creo que han pasado cuántos minutos de cortesía. ¿Cuánto? Cuatro. Esperamos un minuto de cortesía más o, o creéis que cuatro minutos ya es suficiente cortesía. <risa> bueno, uh, sí, vamos a empezar porque Acurro tiene muchas cosas que decirnos, ¿vale? En primer lugar, gracias por, por venir. Um, Siempre hemos reivindicado el hacer este tipo de sesiones y luego cuando las haces estamos poca gente, pero lo importante es lo que se dice siempre, que la, la importancia es la calidad, no la cantidad. ¿vale? Por tanto, a, gracias por estar aquí y espero que sea una sesión productiva, informativa y que bueno, pueda, pueda ayudarnos a entender la complejidad un poco de todos estos temas. ¿no? Bueno, en primer lugar decir que… Um, este es el tercer workshop que se hace en la UPF sobre temas de género y sexualidad, sobre todo minorías sexuales, ¿vale? ah, que se organiza desde el BACES y desde el Departamento de Ciencia Política. Ah, las, eh, básicamente las ediciones previas han sido online, por tanto, esta es la primera que lo hacemos en vivo y en directo, lo cual es, yo creo que tiene un valor, un valor un poco mayor. ¿vale? Ah, y aquí, para el invitado que tenemos hoy es Curro Peña Gómez, Um, que es doctor en Derecho Internacional y, y Derecho de la Unión Europea por las universidades de Milán y de Málaga. Eh, ha elaborado una tesis doctoral básicamente que se centra en los derechos uh, de las personas LGTB en, en, en solicitantes de asilo en la Unión Europea. Y sus principales áreas de investigación incluyen Derecho Internacional de Refugiados, Derechos Humanos, en particular de las personas LGTBI, y las, perso y, y las políticas comunes de inmigración, asilo y control de fronteras en la Unión Europea. Ha, ha trabajado como consultor y trabaja eh, eh, de investigador en ILGA, a que ahora nos explicará exactamente en qué consiste, porque todos tenemos una pequeña idea de lo que es, pero creo que él nos puede dar alguna información un poco más precisa, a, que es una organización bueno, que está en más de 150 países y que lucha básicamente por los derechos del colectivo LGTBI. Y a, a, también trabaja en distintas ONGs, proyectos, a, a, en proyectos y también con instituciones del Ministerio de Igualdad Español, Consejo de Europa, etc. ¿no? Y dirige un blog de divulgación jurídica en cuestiones LGTBI que se llama queerjurídico.es. Ya nos hablarás un poco también de este, de este blog. ¿vale? Y, uh, bueno, básicamente lo que nos viene a hablar de los proyectos de investigación que está llevando a cabo uh, en ILGA, uh, en ILGA World, ¿vale? Y también el impacto que tienen estos proyectos en la evaluación de las políticas públicas. Por tanto, agradecer a Curro su disposición desde el principio para venir a la UPF. Y, y, bueno, básicamente la estructura del acto tiene unos 45 minutos, 50 de presentación, y luego lo interesante sería hacer un, un pequeño debate o vamos a ver una pequeña discusión sobre lo que lo que nos traiga vale por tanto gracias curro y el, el, el tiempo es, es tuyo sí bueno pues muchas gracias por la presentación por la invitación aquí que le decía antes que nunca ha estado en la pompeu fabre y la verdad me hace mucha ilusión y muchísimas gracias por venir que yo sé que un jueves a las 3 de la tarde es un poco complicado pero de verdad que, que os agradezco que, que hayáis venido bien pues mi presentación de hoy, más bien un taller, porque sí que he planteado algunas cosillas para luego estimular un pelín el debate al final y además lo que quiero es enseñaros algo bastante práctico para que lo uséis en vuestro trabajo, sea en la academia, sea para un TF, en TFG o también sea para el activismo o para vuestro trabajo futuro, lo que queráis, eh, creo que puede ser bastante útil. Entonces, eh, sobre todo activismo, investigación y políticas públicas en materia LGTBI, que imagino que alguien estará pensando un arco iris para una exposición LGTBI, groundbreaking, pero <risa> creo que viene bastante bien para que nos metamos en el tema. ¿no? Mi objetivo de hoy, sobre todo, va a ser transmitir esas herramientas que quiero presentar, de herramientas que hemos desarrollado desde la investigación en el activismo, que pueden servir, como digo, para todo tipo de investigación, pero también vemos cómo puede servir para influir en las políticas públicas desde, desde nuestra perspectiva activista. ¿no? Y al final eso, plantear algunos temas que son un poquito más, eh, digamos, dilemas o riesgos que me he encontrado yo al hacer este tipo de investigación. A lo mejor yo es que le doy muchas vueltas a las cosas, pero son como problemáticas más desde un punto de vista político que he visto a la hora de, de trabajar en el activismo LGTBI, ¿no?, desde la investigación. Bien, la, eh, la presentación la he estructurado en cuatro puntos, podrían ser tres, pero me gustaba estéticamente cómo quedaban estos cuatro, así que, en primer lugar, voy a hablar un poco de a qué me refiero con esa sinergia. ¿Sí? Uh, 
I can, I mean, I can do it in English, although the, the text will be in Spanish, but I can try to do it in English if needed. Everybody's okay if I do it in English? Yes? Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. So I will start the game quickly. What I'm going to discuss today is uh, I will try to give you tools for um, that, that we have developed in activism in, re in re the research team of ILGA World and also uh, in ILGA Europe. Um, my main goal with this will be to you for you to know them and to use them both in your academic research, but also if you are involved in activism or in politics, or if you just want to know more about the rights of LGBTI people, I think that these tools will be very, very useful. So the first part of the presentation will be to talk a little about those, uh, what I call synergies between uh, research, activism, and po public policy. Um, so am I too close to the mic or is it? Yes, I tend to, to move a lot, so probably I'll stay here. Then um, I'll, I will discuss specifically, I will show you in a more practical way the tools that we have developed in ILGA World, mainly the ILGA World database. Then I will talk a little about what Rainbow Europe, by, which is developed by ILGA Europe is, and also especially what it is not, because usually media misrepresent a lot what ILGA Europe is, and I think uh, Rainbow Europe does, and I think it's important that, that we, we know it well. And finally, um, I will discuss a little the risk and the dilemmas and all the things that worry me when I'm working on research on uh, queer issues in the um, global context. So, as I said, the, the presentation will be in Spanish, but there is not much text here, so it's not really, I think, it, it won't be a problem. So starting with the research and activism and public policy synergies, I have drawn this diagram, I think. Um, so uh, with investigation, uh, research, activism, and public policy, um, because I think it could help to see those synergies. I have been involved in the three of them, but I'm mainly a researcher. I come from the academia, which means that uh, <coughs> uh, I have I think I, the academia has given me a lot of, how do you translate rigor? Uh, rigor. Rigor. rigor, rigor, okay, thanks. Sometimes when you, I mean, ILGA is a bilingual organization, so sometimes I completely forget if I'm speaking in Spanish or in English, so thank you. So I think it has taught me a lot of rigor that I apply in my research, and sometimes um, from outside of the activism, it's not clear, but it, the researchers that are involved in activism, we, are a lot, of, uh, we are very rigorous. We really want to offer the information, but of course we always have um, ultimate cause, uh, cause with that. We, we, we are not doing that just because we want to show the facts. Of course we want to show the facts, but we want to change the world at the end of the day. We, we really are, we are activists and, and that's the, um, the part of, uh, we change the world through public policies. So um, what we do in the research team of ILGA would be to develop those tools and find that information which is not easy to find. We'll discuss the challenges later a little to provide that um, power to activism. At the end of the day, information is power and in my own experience as an activist, we don't always have the correct facts. We don't always have the correct information. And having someone with the resources to provide it for you and so you can use it in, in whatever capacity and, and, and with the aim you have in activism, I think it's very useful, especially because then activists can go to public policy developers, to, to the MPs, to the governments, to the judges, to explain them uh, what is being done in other countries. For instance, in here in Spain, we've been discussing a lot of the trans law. I, I suppose you are familiar with that. And I'm, at least my part as an activist, there has been a lot of raising awareness on how um, similar laws have been developed in other countries, in Europe and in the world. And that's something that is not information that is easily available. People don't really know what's the legislation of Malta or Uruguay or India. That's, that's not normal knowledge. Even if you go to Wikipedia, it's not always very complete. So what we want to provide here is that information for all the activists. But also it works on the other way. We um, gather information from public policy. The information we provide is um, legislation, is um, judgments, is public policies in a strict sense. And then we, 
uh, what was I saying? Ah, so I, say, I was saying that this goes the other way too, um, because our research feeds public policy um, thinking. Uh, we have found um, times that our research products or our research reports and have been used by policymakers without our intervention. Uh, for instance, I remember now that the Supreme Court of India in a very groundbreaking judgment about the criminalization of uh, same-sex relationships, uh, quoted our work as something that has informed their thinking in, how in, in, in getting a, a progressive judgment, so that happens. And also activism uh, sometimes is acts in a reaction to public, po many times acts in reaction to public policy and ask us to research something that it's important for them. This is something that happens all the time. For instance, me as an individual researcher, I have been working um, during the last couple of weeks on a report on what the situation is in Lebanon for LGBTI people, mainly for activists. And that's because Spanish uh, authorities are saying to Lebanese asylum seekers that Lebanon is a safe country of origin for asylum seekers. So we have to do both ways. We have to uh, react when the public policy is not working well and we have to step up with our research and also we have to pro be proactive and give the research so activists all around the world, uh, grassroots activists mainly can use that information to uh, mobilize uh, public policies towards their goals, okay? So that would be wh what I mean with synergies. And so what's the research we do in, in ILGA world to start this engine of uh, synergies? Well, so that's it, research, ILGA world research. Um, mainly, well, I think before starting, talking about the research that we're doing now, it will be good to understand that the research we've been doing so far, which is mainly these three reports, which are called state-sponsored homophobia, which is the most famous one of the reports that we have made. It's the one referenced by the Indian Supreme Court and other uh, instances around the world, the tr uh, Translegal Mapping Report and Carving Deception. These three reports, the first one uh, started being very focused on uh, legislation that criminalized um, same-sex acts between consenting adults, but then expanded towards uh, other legislation related to sexual orientation, and this is important, just sexual orientation. We gather a lot of legislation from all around the world on uh, banning discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, also aggravating hate crimes committed on sexual orientation, etc. Then on translegal mapping report, we mainly work it on legal gender recognition, which if you're not familiar with the term, it means that it, we, we use it to refer to um, changing um, the, the mechanism that are put in place to allow trans people to amend their personal documents so they reflect their gender identity. And also some of criminalization based on gender expression, we got it there too. And then we got carving deception, which is good that we are doing this in English because I forgot the Spanish translation for, for the official Spanish name for that report, which is about conversion therapy. So we got these three reports, each of them focused in a specific issue, and they worked for a while. Uh, actually, this map here, which is from 2020, um, if you can see it, well, it's okay because we're not using this anymore, spoiler. So I just wanted to, to show it to you. It's uh, very complete in the sense that, or so, uh, so uh, we thought, because it included all the criminalizing countries, all in the same region, and all the blue good countries protecting uh, LGBTI people, right? Uh, it included the red countries are those who criminalize, who are opposed to, to the rights of uh, mainly same-sex couples, and the blue ones are the ones who have some kind of protection uh, on grounds of sexual orientation. So, we were using this map as a very comprehensive um, tool, but in truth it's not. It doesn't include a lot of information that we need about our communities. It's only about sexual orientation, and, and I'm spoiling myself here, because <laughs> that was the, other, the next, um, right. There were a lot of problems with this report. It was just about homophobia. It was only about sexual orientation, but what's going on with laws protecting against discrimination on gender identity, on gender expression, sex characteristics. It's 
if you look at the map before, it was like very clear that there was a distinction between the global north and the global south that can feel it's a stigmatizing sometimes and can and this is something that we will come back later about reinforcing narratives, colonialist narratives, etc. So it was important that I mean the global north is not always that good. The global south is not always that bad. So that map before was problematic in itself. And it wasn't in real time. I mean, if we have to produce a report every year, um, things happen very fast. Specifically in, in LGBTI legislation, we see that there are explosions of uh, criminalization in the country or explosions or, or laws that change the game for, for everybody in the country. So we needed something quicker. And also, it's only talk about state sponsor, not all, I mean, there are a lot of issues, and especially in countries where state is not very powerful, that other institutions are in place that might be um, uh, sponsoring LGBT phobia. So what we did here was, oh, sorry, I'm, uh, there was another issue, but it was the same issue with the Translegal Mapping Report and Curving Deception. Translegal Mapping Report was only about trans people, uh, so we got, one report for sexual orientation, one other for one specific aspect of gender identity. We completely forgot about sex characteristics, intersex people, and we didn't talk about other issues that are key for trans people. What about discrimination in healthcare or in education, which today are two very, very big issues for trans people around the world, specifically in the US or, or in many countries of Europe. And then with covering deception, it's okay to have a report on conversion therapies, but we need more. So now that's when we developed the ILGA World Database, which is a really big expansion on those three um, reports. And I, I hope I can show it to you. Yes, it works, great. So I'm gonna put it in English. It's completely bilingual. We have it in Spanish and English, and we work a lot in having all the information in both languages. So um, I'm gonna drink water. No, right now it's only in English and Spanish because that's our, those are the two uh, uh, official languages of ILGA. Well, I, I didn't, you asked me for to explain a little bit about ILGA and I think it, it, this is a good moment. ILGA is a federation of around, I think we are already 1,500 organizations from all around the world. And our main languages of work and the official languages according to our statutes are Spanish and English. So that's why the, the database is in both languages. Although the, when we have the resources, we try to translate the, uh, our work in other languages. For instance, uh, our previous reports were, were, the report was not translated, but the map was translated to French, Malay, Arabic, I think, many languages, but that's resource dependent. <laughs> so the ILGA World Database, as I said, um, it's, it's an expansion of all those reports. Here you can find, not all the information you need, of course, but a lot of information on uh, many different issues. There are some videos here that I will not show you, but you can check them later. Um, but I can find the button. Sorry. Ah, here. About many different, it is not, showing well in this computer, but here you'll have area one, which says legal frameworks. In this area, we got all the information from the other reports and more. If we, in the report, talk about discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, here we talk about discrimination in sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, sex characteristics. We talked about um, freedom, uh, restriction to freedom of speech or criminalization. We also talk here about restrictions on um, uh, unconsented surgeries for intersex minors. So many different issues that are key for our communities around the world. We are compiling here all the legislation and the jurisprudence and case law and everything that we need and we find, given our capacities, we have it here. Then we also got another section for, which is hu uh, human rights treaties. We compile here. I will show you later how these areas work. But we compile here um, which states of the world have ratified the main uh, human rights treaties of the United Nations, so very useful for any uh, 
terms of international politics or international human, uh, human rights law, you have that information here uh, at the end. Then we got area three with UN treaty bodies and area four with UN special procedures. And they both compiled every mention um, to sexual diversity, bodily diversity or gender diversity issues that have been made by either the treaty bodies of, the, of those treaties of the United Nations, some of them, I mean, they create um, bodies, they create organs that make recommendations and decisions. So we, like for instance, the Human Rights Committee is one of those. Here we include all the mentions and recommendations that those organs have made on these issues and also on the UN special procedures, which if you are not familiar with that, is when we talk about a special rapporteur for housing, for the um, violence against women, etc. We have it here also, independent experts and working groups. All that information is here. And also in area five, we got the universal periodic review, which is this evaluation that the UN does of the, how states are complying with the human rights uh, obligations. We also have here all the recommendations made um, during that uh, universal periodic review on uh, on, um, on uh, sexual, gender, and bodily diverse uh, issues. And then we have another section that's still under construction, so I will not go there, but it's about how the UN countries are voting in resolutions related to LGBTI people. So I will show you a little bit of this. It's th this is a very big database, so I will not show you all of that. I will mainly give you the, um, some hints, and then I would really recommend you to go and, and navigate them because they are very, very useful and have a lot of information. So, um, for instance, we got, I don't know, as I said before, discrimination in education. Before, we only have discrimination in general and only on sexual orientation grounds, but now we have protection against discrimination in education, and you can navigate them up um, in terms of sexual orientation, gender identity, and it will show you um, which countries of the world have legislation banning discrimination on grounds of gender identity. Uh, since this workshop is more focused on Europe, there's also the possibility of choosing which region of the world you want to be um, focused on, in this case, Europe. You can hover the map and see the year in, wi the year in which these countries, these uh, states started to protect against discrimination in gender identity, and of course there are many ways of um, uh, customizing the map in case you need to download it. But I think, for me, the, the most important, the most interesting part is a little bit below. Well, here we have the number of states that protect, etc. We got the explanation of the methodology and a list of updates of this particular issue around the world. Uh, some graphs that you might find useful to visualize what's the evolution of this issue in the world. But then you got um, a chart here that is loading with, uh, no, this one, with explanation of all of that. And this, I think, is the key part, and this is where we work the most, because this is actually hard to compile, but I think it's the most useful part. When I was doing my PhD, I think this could have been a game changer completely for me. First, because uh, here we have a lot of explanation of what specific legislation of that country, what is it about. For instance, in the case of Albania, we got here, it says that Article 5 of the Protection from Discrimination Law bans discrimination, etc. We say the specific article, we say what the um, uh, characteristic, we got sexual orientation here. I can't, no, uh, here it is. We got also gender identity, etc. And what is the most interesting for me is that we have the source. You can go to a specific law that you need and just open it. And we have all of them uh, stored in our own repository. So mm, usually we try, to f we, we try to find translations of the text, but it's not always possible. In this case, many European countries, there are translations that are in the Council of Europe or in the Venice Commission. They do translations. Usually they are in the original language but you have the source here. So we offer a little bit of information in the explanation, and then anybody who is interested can go and, and go here. I mean, when I was looking at legislation on asylum around Europe or on discrimination mainly, this could have been very, very useful because otherwise you have to look into Google all the time and, and it's not easy at all. You can also 
so just look at European uh, or, or whatever group that you want, we got both regional uh, geographical uh, classification, but also more geopolitical ones. We got in, uh, international organizations such as the Council of Europe, but you can also sort by the G7 or many, many different organizations. So this can, if you are trying to go like um, very, very surgically chosen investigation, just focusing on some region, in the Balkans or whatever, you can use this, uh, this chart and you will really find a lot of information to, to kickstart your, your research, no? So I think it's very, very useful. And actually I use this a lot in my research outside of ILGA. I said before that I had to do um, some research on Lebanon. I also have to do some research on Georgia. And I used a lot of this data. It's not only this part of this lesson, but especially the part about the United Nations. For example, if you go to special procedures, I don't know if any of you have ever do some work with uh, documents from the United Nations, but sometimes it can be really a nightmare. I, I was going to say something less polite, so I was trying to choose the, the correct one, but it can be a nightmare. It's very hard to navigate the website of the United Nations. Mm, documents disappear all the time. The, the, you're always led to very dead ends. So here in the, it doesn't happen with ILGA. We have really worked in, in avoiding that. Because what we do here first, we got a map where you can hover over the countries. Again, let's focus on, on Europe, which is the point of this workshop. Um, and you can see how many mentions to LGBT issues has been done in, in a, it, it's not loading, but I will explain, I will describe it to you, what you should be seeing. You can hover over the countries and you will see the number of mentions that, for instance, the independent expert on migration, the special rapporteur on migration, for instance, have done on, on so just issues concerning that specific country. This is not loading, I will go to the next part. But again, you can find the, the explanations here. So, as I said before, we um, have stored our own, we have our own repository, we also have it for here. So. It won't be, again, the problem of trying to find the report of the special rapporteur uh, when they visited Albania, for instance. I don't know. Yeah, this is a mission to Albania. Um, you just have to click, and we have the story, so it's very much, much more easier to find. We also have the specific quote here, um, and the specific reference, and you can also, this is something that if you have been already working on your um, final, um, dissertation for, for the degree or for the master, you will find this very useful. You, there is a button here that you click it and the entry is copied with a, a reference. So it's, we are trying to be useful. All the time our main focus is to be useful to everybody. So this is very, and also you can be useful to us because the, uh, you know, if you see, I don't know if you see it well, but yeah, you can see it. Uh, besides this button, which is to copy the reference, you got another with comments. We really like comments, and we really especially, we like to be told uh, what is not correct. We love corrections, because this is a very big work, so there are mistakes. Not all, maybe, maybe not in this part, because this is copying from the United Nations, but in the other part. So if you ever see something that is not really well, or you are dubious about it, just write us, uh, and I will review it very happily. And, and also, you can sort all the, I'm gonna change from Albania, I don't want to, to put Albania on the spotlight all the time, but Algeria, um, which is the next one. But also you can sort by uh, topics. We got tags for every single topic, so you can, I don't know if you're interested in hate crimes, and you see everything that has been going on in the special procedures of the United Nations concerning hate crimes. Um, again, a lot of sorters, so this is something that you can customize for your needs, and I think it's very, very useful. And um, to finish with this part, uh, as, as I said, I really recommend you to go and, and play with it. I, I find it very deep, fun to, to use sometimes, maybe because I'm a nerd, but <laughs> I really, I really enjoy doing this, so I really recommend you to do it. Um, there is also the option instead of by topic or by area, you can go by jurisdiction. Um, for instance, I don't know, just click whatever Germany, 
um, and you can see, oh, something I forgot to say, that we also have information about the sub-regional level. If, if you go, I will show you, because I think that's really cool. If you go to, for instance, I don't know, discrimination in healthcare, um, if you go to, for instance, a country like Spain, which is uh, more complex, you can find uh, what's the situation in the specific, uh, in this case, autonomous community, and mm, where, where there is no protections, to have a little bit more of nuance. And we you can also do this not only with Spain, but uh, many, not all the federations of the world have this yet. We are working on that. But for instance, if you want to see uh, Argentina or the United States or uh, Australia, Austria, also um, we got the prefectures of Japan and the provinces of Philippines. So we're trying to, to cover as much as we can. So you can go to, to, to that level. And as I said before, we are, you can also look by jurisdiction. For instance, if you go to France, um, we got um, as, uh, we, yeah, we have here a um, collection of the latest news concerning uh, France because all of the information here in the database, we got it from another tool that we have, which is a monitor of around, around 50, 15,000 sources from around the world, mainly media sources, but also academic sources, government sources. And we use that, uh, we have a team looking for entries that affect legal developments and we put here, but I will go fast here. As I can say, you can see in a, a just a snapshot of what's going on in the country, what is the legislation there. So if you really need something quick, some information about it, you can go here, you get explanations, and I think pretty cool, to be honest. So uh, moving on to, to the next part. So that's the database. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we've been working so hard for uh, some years in that, so I'm, I'm glad I can get to show it to you, and I think it's gonna be really useful for you. But moving on um, to Europe. So that's the main tool that we have developed in ILGA World, but also ILGA Europe, which is, we are part of the same family, but they have the, um, their own research team and they have their own work. They, just last week or some days ago, they released their own, uh, edi the new edition of Rainbow Europe, which is, I will, say, I will explain it, is, is uh, um, a project with mm, a lot of very interesting information. I'm sure you probably have seen this map, maybe on social media, because it has been everywhere. This is the map and ranking of the latest edition. We'll go later to the map again, but uh, I just wanted to, to see your faces and see if you have seen this. I think you did, so great. Um, but what worries me, and this is the only, mm, probably the only one with a lot of text in, in the whole presentation, what worries me is that I usually think people don't really understand what this uh, map is about. Um, so Rainbow Europe is a package of research, of, of, uh, of information. ILGA Europe produces both the rainbow map and index, which is what you've seen before, and also an annual review, which is a report on um, political and social developments that have been really important for that specific European country over the last year. So it's like a lot of information, in, um, but usually people, for some reason, see it in another way. Um, uh, the, what, the, both, what the Rainbow Map and Index is about is about legislation and public policy. I will, um, but, and also the nano reviews, to say, is about uh, key developments in social and politics and also their recommendation to states. But what is really interesting here is what it is not. And this is what people usually get wrong. It's not a survey on social attitudes. It's not, when you see that map, people tend to say, oh, but why this country that is very open has this really low uh, score? Or why this country that is very uh, hostile to LGBT people has the same score as these others? It's not also uh, about LGBT, anti LGBT violence, and it's not about how this legislation is applied in practice. It's about legislation, which is the same as the ILGA war. We, I mean, when you are um, looking at everything from, I mean, I, I usually see ILGA world, we are like an off, uh, off, you know, like a UFO. We are flying over the world and we see something, but we can go to the detail. That's why we have to cooperate all the time with, with L LGBT organizations. The same with ILGA Europe. You can, database are always limited and, and reports are always limited in themselves. But it's important to know that this is about legislation and public policy. 
Um, so that's why, and I come back, uh, I will come back to the map later. So how do they elaborate this map? They, there are a lot of uh, indicators. In this case, I have chosen one, which is equality and non-discrimination. And they see what this the legislation of this country and the public policies provide for. There is, there is a ban on discrimination on employment, check, check, check. And then they give uh, a value to the to, to each of those uh, indicators and then give a f that's what gives the full score. And when they have the full score of all the countries of Europe, they have again the map and the ranking, which is here, I think, yes, you can see it. Here is the ranking and the map is ordered with the ranking. So sometimes people all, I mean, at least always ask me, but why is Hungary uh, higher than Italy when Hungary is, I mean, now we can say that anymore because the uh, Italian government is quite hostile to LGBT people. But usually that's asked, or why is Andorra so low? I can go to Andorra with my partner and I have no problem uh, because Andorra is not approving enough legislation to protect LGBT people. And so when you look at this map, my main goal with this slide and explaining this is that you know this is about legislation and public policy, which is a very important issue, but it's not all. Where the LGBT people, we don't, our lives are not only explained by legislation. There are a lot of other um, issues affecting the, the realities of LGBTI people. But it's, in itself, it's very useful for that, okay? So I, ju I just wanted to refer that. And we can, I mean, I have been showing you the maps from Ilga War because that, that's, those are the ones that were the most. We can also talk about those maps and this map later, but now I think, I think it's the same. Yes, this is the, the one that I really want to, to go into. Did you find it yet? Great. Because as I said before, when I've been doing research on these issues, I've seen, mm, I don't know, risk. I call this risk and dilemmas, and there is a, a boat because it's navigating the, the <laughs> risk and dilemma, which is the most, the corniest metaphor I could come up, but I could have been worse, sorry for that. So these are issues that I've been uh, thinking about when I've been doing research. Uh, you know, uh, maybe I over-problematize things. I don't know, maybe it's because I come from the academia or maybe because I'm just paranoid. But I start thinking, hey, how the way we portray our results can affect um, our communities? Can, how can it affect the narratives that are going on all the time, both within, uh, inside the countries, but also in the world and in Europe. So I tried to, I, I thought it was interesting to bring you these doubts because I don't really have an answer for many of the things that I, I am going to explain to talk about here, but I think it's interesting that we have them in mind when we research on, on LGBTI issues. First of all is rigor and veracity and truthness. Um, so this is something that is, is normal in, in any, when you're trying to do something serious and you are worried that the results that you are showing are correct and, and are, going and, and are facts, are fact-based. But as I said before, we compile our information from mm, thousands of sources, so we end up having a lot of fake news, a lot. For instance, I remember some weeks ago, my team, because I coordinate the monitoring team at ILGA, um, my team was saying, hey, uh, we found this entry saying that Moldova has approved same-sex marriage. And I was like, I don't think that's true, but let's see it. And of course it didn't. It's just that in many countries, especially when they're trying to portray a negative image of a new law, if this law is about the slightest development for LGBTI issues or even uh, any kind of gender equality issue. We, for instance, I'm thinking now about the Istanbul Convention. Many countries are saying that the Istanbul Convention will legalize same-sex marriage, which it doesn't. It's about the, uh, violence against women. So we have a lot of these fake news that we have to really filter them and discuss them and say, hey, careful with this because, or, or also not really fake news, but well, yeah, fake news, manipulations of what the, the reality, manipulation of the reality. For instance, when we have a lot of and please, um, using dog whistle to talk about how trans people are dangerous for children or women. So sometimes it's hard to, to detect them because I mean, I have experience in that, especially in Spanish media, in, in 
maybe in Spanish, sorry, maybe in English, but when you have an entry from, I don't know, Bulgaria in a language that we don't speak, sometimes we don't even know if the translation is exactly what, um, what we, the, the problem is the translation or the problem is the content. So, uh, and, and usually European languages can be translated with uh, automatic translation, but when we have sources from, uh, I don't know, Egypt or Bangladesh or countries with uh, an alphabet that is not the Latin one, usually Google Translate and DeepL start working very, very badly. I'm starting to use ChatGPT for that, which is not that bad to, to translate. So uh, I, there's some hope there, but now what we try to do is to have uh, as much diverse of a team as we can. We got people who speak Arabic, people who speak Chinese, uh, French, Spanish, English, and of the six languages of the United Nations, we're still missing someone who speaks Russian. We had someone until recently, but we try to have this different, um, not only because of the languages, of course, but because of the background. I mean, in our team right now, we got people from Spain in my case, but also from Malaysia, China, Morocco, uh, Guatemala, Argentina, and Colombia. So we try to have also knowledge about very, very different uh, legal systems around the world because, I mean, usually European systems can be more or less comparable. I mean, if I see a judgment by the Supreme Court of, I don't know, um, or the, Constitu the Constitutional Court of Hungary, I can more or less understand what the legal value of a judgment by the Constitutional Court of Hungary has. But if I see a fatwa from a religious authority in Malaysia, I have no idea. I, I don't really know. It. Is this a legal development at all? It's like, so we got someone from Malaysia that has worked a lot on saying, hey, this is important for this, for this, for that. So having a diverse background is important both for languages and to understand what you're talking about. Uh, but sometimes, I mean, we can have a team of 200 people from all around the world. So we have to rely also on local informants. I call it local informant, but that sounds weird. It sounds like we have spies all over the world. I mean, not really, we wish, but what we have is people from grassroots organizations that we are in contact with and that they explain us, hey, this that you have written here is not correct. Or uh, we reach to them and say, hey, what's going on with this? Um, for instance, I've been in talks with activists from Japan, Dominican Republic, um, that I'm uh, hungry a lot. Also, sometimes I reach to politicians because who knows, if they are proposing a bill that we see that might be good, I ask them to, so they can send me the full text or they can explain it. I've been talking a lot with an um, MP from Cyprus for this. So we try to rely on, of course, usually we tend to, f we want to favor the views of the NGOs that are the members of ILGA, we are a federation, but also because we, as I said before, we are researchers um, with an activist uh, focus. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be rigorous. We say, according to specific organization stuff, we, we, we don't, uh, I critically repeat what they say, but I think it's important to have their views in, in the research because at the end of the day, as I said before, we want to be useful. We want uh, the activism, to uh, local activism to use our research and to find it useful for their goals, not to be against their goals, which is what I, we're going to discuss now when we talk about how this research can reinforce, I say, undesirable narratives to be very broad, but I think uh, it's interesting that we go there. This is this is where I say that I maybe maybe and I'm paranoid. I don't think so. I think there is something interesting here that some reflection that we from activists and especially from global activism have to to take into account is how the way we portray the information can, as I said before, um, reinforce the inequalities between the north, global north and the global south by reinforcing narratives such as, as I said before the the previous map that we have. It was very clear that the red, bad, Africa, blue, good, Europe. It was very clear that that's not working. Um, so we have to be careful in the way we portray it. Now with the database, what we do is, hey, we're talking about criminalization, so we are going to color the countries that have criminalization. That's the fact, we cannot go in against that. But when we talk about, uh, I don't know, discrimination in, in education, we're going to highlight the countries that have it, which is not, not only the, the European countries, that's not true, and, and in fact, there are some issues where Latin American countries have gone way beyond what European countries have done, and they did it before. Uh, the, the most um, known case probably is legal gender recognition. 
Argentina was the pioneer in the war on, on allowing self, uh, LG, uh, legal gender recognition mechanism based on self-determination, like we in 2023 have adopted in Spain. So um, we need to really um, be careful with how we portray the information to not give um, to not, yeah, to not give a, a, a misrepresentation of what the global efforts towards LGBTI rights are. And also because we can have, um, I call it fake um, feeling of satisfaction, right? This is something that I see in Spain now, uh, when we see our new trans law, and now I'm talking from the ag grassroots activist perspective, I don't think it's, that good. I mean, we can we could have gone way beyond what we've done. In legal gender recognition, there are issues that can be improved, but in other issues, we did nothing. I, I, I mainly collaborate with a work in, in an NGO uh, against conversion therapies, the Spanish Association Against Conversion Therapies, Nuestra no Terapia, and we know that nothing that we ask for has been done. Uh, yeah, it, there have been banned, but that's not enough. We need a way more. They're not even defined in the law, so we don't know what the, the thing that has been banned. So if we just see, look at Rainbow Europe or the Inca World Database, and we go to Spain and conversion therapies, we'll say, check, Spain has banned them, but it's not going to be useful in our view. So we have to be careful on, on to really, that's why I really insist on what Rainbow Europe and Ilga World Database say and what they don't say, because if we think they say more than what they say, we might end up mm, not really uh, knowing what um, what the real situation is. And also, I think sometimes um, this is very related to the global north against global sur south um, narrative, orientalism. Sometimes I feel like, uh, in Europe in particular, we got a view of how we got, there's an ongoing narrative on how the Western Europe is this civilized and pro-LGBTI region of the world, while Eastern Europe, particularly Russia, is uncivilized. Is. So, I mean, we can criticize the politics of the Russian government without falling into essentialist and orientalist uh, views of the world, right? So this is, I think it's something that we have to take into account when we work on, on, on these issues. And also, of course, we have to be careful about, um, uh, because when Ilga Ward says, this is what happens in this issue, it takes all the attention and other issues that we don't cover because we don't, may not have the capacity. For instance, we don't have now the resources to talk about asylum. Uh, that doesn't mean that that country is doing well in asylum issues, so we have to be aware of how when we talk about something and we don't talk about other issue, we might be casting a very huge shadow over, over that issue. So food for thought for activism, more, I, I, I think it's interesting. And last but not least, uh, we have to be aware that our research can be instrumentalized. Um, I have mentioned here the cases of homonationalism and heterona straight nationalism. Heteronationalism, I don't know if you use that word in English. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept, but homonationalism is when um, LGBTI rights are weaponized to, for instance, hmm, it's hard to explain it now in English, now that I think about it, for me, because I have it prepared in Spanish, but okay, yeah. For instance, um, We've seen this right now a lot in Europe. I was talking about before the Orientalism issue of saying that Eastern Europe is essentially anti-LGBTI. Well, when you got a nationalistic narrative trying to go away from Russia, which we have a lot of narrative species right now like that, there is a risk of saying, hey, we have to advance the rights of LGBTI people, not because they are human beings and they need to have their rights respected, but because we have to differentiate from Russia, and especially because we have to be near Europe. So now we can see that maybe a mm, European identity being constructed over the value of protecting LGBTI people, there are some risks there. But also with internationalism, which is what the Russian authorities are doing all the time, they're trying to go away from the European values by defending traditional values, which are based in going against the rights of LGBTI people. So. And in both cases, our research can be weaponized all the time. Um, we can say, hey, this country is really doing badly in Rainbow Europe, so we really shouldn't, uh, th that's because they are not Europeans, etc. But also you can say, hey, this country is doing very well, these organizations are 
saying us, what we have to do, that's not, um, no, that, that's, um, they're trying to go undermine our sovereignty. They're trying to, because we are a global organization. They say that we are uh, the global elite, etc. So there's things that we have to keep in mind. Of course, being washing, we all know this. We usually use the case of um, Israel to explain it, but I have found in my own work a, a new case that I never thought about some last week, talking again about the Georgia report, how Georgia has approved a lot of legislation uh, protecting LGBT people, but it's not really reaching the population. And they're doing that, uh, one, on an homo-nationalistic rhetoric to say, hey, we are European, but then they don't really apply it in practice. And also as a pink washing for what the government does, because the, the, the prime minister was two weeks ago discussing in a forum in Hungary how LGBT propaganda is trying to destroy the institution, the civilization and the institution, blah, blah, and all the usual, I was going to say another unpolite word, sorry. Uh, and last but not least, it can also be used in countries that are performing really well in these rankings or in our Iran Gowers database to avoid new developments. This is something that I, an Argentina activist uh, raised this problem to me and told me, hey, we are worried that when Ilga said something, it's taking us the Bible. And, and if we go to our government and we say, hey, we need to do more in this issue, for instance, talking about Argentina, in trans issues. And then the government say, no, but you say all the global indicators like Ilga war, that they say that we are doing well, why, what there is more to do it. So th these are the kind of issues that we have to take into account. And now I will just say gracias or thank you because it, it was in English at the end. And you have my contacts here and thank you so much for listening to me. Well, many thanks to Curro for the presentation and for this, uh, well, a huge amount of information we have for to do very nice research, okay? This is full of research, so you can use all this data in your future career, you know? So now, okay, we open the floor for discussion and for questions and or comments. Well, I, I will start. Uh, because you have presented so much information about so many different things, although in a very quick fashion, you know. So my question is, uh, to what extent is trustable this information? Because according to what you said, I, I had some doubts about the, for example, uh, 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 um, the quality and the accurate accuracy of, of the information, okay? And, and, and second question related to this is, uh, uh, to what extent there is a trade-off between the quantity and the quality of the information you have? Because uh, m my perception is that you are trying to basically cover so many things, and you know what happens sometimes if you try to cover too many things and you don't cover anything. So I would like to know, as, as an insider, what is your view about this? So about the, the first question about the accuracy, I mean, I have here the doubts that we have during the process of finding the information but we really try to um, mm, check it with not only I mean when I say we go to local informants I mean that we use them to, to provide us their feedback their information but then we take make decisions based on that and we sometimes when we don't really know what we do we say it we say this is this unclear what the situation is this we, we offer just the information we are honest in that we don't have all the answers and this is related to the quality against quantity we are not trying to do to give all the information that there is we're just trying to provide a um, first door a, a getaway to all that information we say hey we have found that there is a law in this country in articles blah blah saying that discrimination is banned here you have the source so if you need to know more, go there and, and explore it and see how it's regulated. And if you think it's not really what we say, say, talk to us and we will discuss it and we will see if this, we just offer some more information. We're not trying to, that's why we, at Ilga World at this, we don't have, we don't offer a, a score for every other countries because we, we can know. We, there are a lot of different um, factors playing into, into that, but we offer the information, we got the source so people can check it and for themselves and work. 
And then sometimes we can make mistakes and we will correct. This is a work always in progress. I don't know if that answered the question. Very vaguely, you know, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> uh, no, because I mean, uh, 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 here I get that we are some researchers, so if we want to use this data, we would like to know to what extent you can trust this data, okay? Because uh, 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 to collect this data is not, I guess it's a very complex, particularly in some countries, okay? And, and also when, when, whenever I think there is an axiom here that the more people are involved in, in, into a project like this, the more diversity is also in the data collection, in the way you process the data and, and all these uh, important issues, okay? So, uh, well, the question was more related how to deal with this complexity and how to make trustable this data now, particularly for researchers, okay? But in any case, I mean, I know this is a difficult question because you need to have complete information about so many colleagues you will have in ILGA, and and that's that's difficult, okay? Um, What's the team like? I mean, like we are actually not a big team. <laughs> we are like um, right now eight people, and we got a supervisor. I mean, I'm not even the the high. I, I coordinate the monitoring process, but we got the supervisor who checks all of that, review it, and as I said. We find information through a lot of sources and we discuss it, we contrast it, we do a full research process with that. It's not that just we find something and we put it on the data. It's there is weeks of, of work on that involved. But I don't know what you mean. Wait, wait, because for public people, you have a much better team. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, my name is Fernanda Fortes de Lena. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the Center for Demographic Studies here in Barcelona. Uh, I, was I was wondering a little bit when during your presentation in the beginning when you talk about the synergy between investigation, activism, and public policy. And uh, when you were presenting, I was thinking, like, what is the next step then for Ilga to kind of get within, like, the investigation part? Because what you presented, at least for uh, here, it's like uh, what's Ilga uh, and what they are sharing, like, the, the information that they are making available for people to do their activism and their research. But how is it this how is the synergy with the, the academia going on? Because like, I'm a part of uh, a group and we are doing research, but I think this connection with NGOs is still very uh, fragile. So I wanted to know your thoughts on that. Well, thank you so much for, for the question. Um, I mean, this is a very new tool, so we're still trying to, to get people to know it. And of course, it will be better with the feedback that we receive, especially from, in this case, uh, uh, academia too. Um, uh, I mean, now what we provide is the sources, and in the case of the United Nations, issue, we provide the, the direct quote. But I think it can improve a lot, and we're still discussing how to improve it. Mainly, one of the ways we are going to do it is to expand the issues that we talk about. We have received a lot of feedback on how we don't um, cover some issues that are key to for LGBTI people. But also, we are going to keep releasing reports. I have not presented everything. There we have another report that is maybe not for academia, but it's very useful in, in especially in asylum and public uh, policy making and, and asylum day-to-day um, -day work, which is a report on all the cases that we have m managed to track of criminalization, specific uh, enforcement of criminalizing laws. And then we are also going to uh, produce another report on all the new legal developments that we have tracked, be it bills or laws. How can it be specifically improved towards um, academic research? I don't have a re answer yet, but I can tell that th these are the things that we have in, in mind. And I think this kind of Events can be useful because I can gather that feedback. I'm always open to receive all the comments, and so whatever idea you might have on how this can be useful to you, it, it will be great to, to have. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, hey, my name is Edwin Trujillo. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. I'm making a master in international relations. 
And I have two questions. One is, um, uh, well, the first one is not a question. It's like um, a comment. Uh, I feel like um, the tool that you have it that uh, shows a different development in the countryside on the small cities in the country is like a, it's like a good tool because personal, I, I, I see like in the big cities, the perception of LGBT friendly or freedom or whatever is more higher than in the small cities and the countryside. So I think it's, I think something that you have to improve if you didn't have it in the countries like South America or whatever, because the perception of, of, of LGBT friendly and freedom of speech and whatever is completely different in a city like Bogota, like another in the coast or in the middle of the country, so it's different. Um, this is the question is like, do you have, I see some cities like Amsterdam and Barcelona, uh, and I've been traveling here like a, a lot of time ago, and I used to see like these cities, those cities like um, paradise for LGBT people. But lately I, I feeling like a, it's like a kind of back, back, going back a little bit in some issues. I don't know is, if it happened because it's a lot of people, immigrants with a very tight or very uh, conservative uh, religious or something like that. But for example, in some places like in Amsterdam, it's extremely that you cannot walk in holding your hand because it's, it's pretty dangerous right now. So I don't know if you are really making some research about it what is the main cause or what is this, how we can deal with that? Like in the cities, like used to be like a paradise, it's no in paradise anymore. And thank you for your comments. About the first one, well, we don't go to that much level of detail. We don't go to the detail of the city. As I said before, we are a little bit hovering over, over the world. So we go to the state level and then the very first sub-regional, uh, sub-state level. Um, but we, I mean, as I said, we are trying to be useful for the grassroots organizations, so the organizations can develop over that and, and also on the local level, but we don't cover that. As for the second part, I will say that probably those cities weren't a paradise for everybody before, so I don't think they never were a paradise for a lot of people, and I don't think it's that if we can find some kind of setback on the rights of LGBTI people in Western Europe, I don't think we have to look at the uh, anybody in the community, but a bit over that, uh, about the, as I said, th those narratives that are flying around Europe right now and are permeating our policy. For instance, the, the trans law in Spain was a very good example of that. There were a lot of uh, um, backlash against it from, way, from um, places that we didn't have it before, we thought that it was before, but that's not something that's only happening in Spain. No, those narratives are going, and anti-gender narratives or anti-trans people narratives are moving all around Europe. So it's not something that we can find on the street or anything. I, I think all of us are uh, way below the level of, of where those problems are stemming from, I think. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, it is indeed a lot of work. I think it's several PhDs are going into those tables. Um, I was. I have a question, and I don't know if it's, it's something you're doing. If not, maybe something we could do. It has to do with. Um, I found it very interesting when you talked about whether legislation is or not applied or enforced in a country. Right? You, you put the example of Georgia, and it, it is always an issue with when you think about legislation. To what extent this translates into reality? Right? And I wonder whether you have any sort of warning system attached to this, like when pink washing or other other forms of are happening and if not my suggestion would be to <laughs> if you could add it because you have not only the information in terms of legislation but you also have people on the ground you check with who can also tell you which is something that's much harder to obtain for someone who doesn't have the organization that's actually one of the key issues that we are finding now that we have uh, opening to the public for instance i was uh, presenting it to a group of activists from spanish-speaking country which includes Latin America, but also Equatorial Guinea. And we got an activist from Equatorial Guinea who told us that uh, when we have uh, mentioned that G Equatorial Guinea had accepted a recommendation in the context of the um, Universal Periodic Review, it could be understood as 
Equatorial Guinea is protecting the rights of liberated people, which is completely the opposite. And so here there are two answers. One is that we should, uh, and this is the one that I gave to both the activists and to my supervisor when we discussed it, we probably need to be um, more obvious with the warning. We probably have to put it that, hey, this is just legislation. In the case of the Universal Periodic Review, this is just what the state said, which doesn't mean that it covers what the state did. So probably it could, should be clear to avoid those narratives. Um, the other part is that, of course, we can, uh, we can warn it, but the information would always be the same because we cannot, at, at the level of the database, we don't have the capacity to give the, that level of information of all the countries in the world. So an idea that I have, I, I don't think we are going to develop it that way, was to have a space in the database um, for reports produced by the NGOs in the country. Of course, just to say, hey, this is what the NGOs in the country are saying. So what we do is give the information and you use it uh, with the criteria you want to at least have that version of um, on the ground level, no? But yeah, th this is something that we are still discussing on how to better reflect it, so thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'm gonna check that database for sure. <laughs> I'm actually gonna do that tomorrow, probably. Um, so I was wondering, I mean, it was close to Alva's and Esther's um, questions about like this relation to the kind of like lived experiences uh, part of, of like I, I'm missing kind of like that side. So I'm wondering how me, for example, or, or us as a project um, could develop studies that could like help to use this tool and like reconnect, for example, I'm thinking about I'm Argentinian, so um, a lot of the gender identity law and that, I, I mean, I love it in the paper, it's beautiful. And then the actual lived experiences of, of like we queer individuals is quite different from what, what's there. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm like really hoping for the census data to come out uh, soon so I can like get into that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was wondering if you have like any sort of like ideas or projects that you know about that work more on the lived experiences part and like related to um, this information. Thank you. So um, even if I didn't get into it, I think I mentioned it, we got a monitor of that. Right now the monitor is not open to public, but I think if you write me, we can find a way. I think I will ask my supervisor, I think he told me that we can open it to some kind of research. There what we have is bulk of data of, of all the media that we have. So we cannot review all of that. Uh, we do, we review, there is a human part of review, but not in saying this is correct, this is not. We say this is the tractionary, this is about this issue, but we don't discriminate, we don't classify it. So we just have it and then we review it later for the data. If this is previous to the data. There, there are reports by a grassroots organization that when they can, they go into that kind of detail. But right now we don't have plans of talking about that in the database. Maybe, as I said before, we thought about um, highlighting those reports just so people can have that part of the story too. But right now we really wanted to focus on the legislation, even if we knew that that's just one part of the story. All that I have explained today is just one part of the story. That That's why I wanted to include all the later slides to discuss about when we just talk about this part of the story, we might miss other and we have might reinforce very problematic thinking. So just uh, as a food for thought, but I think yeah, we will try to find a way of highlighting also that part. More questions or points to make? Um, it's not um, maybe to comment or maybe you said so, but I missed it. Um, the what I'm looking over here in Ilga is there any support from any institution? Obviously, you are also researching, so I'm going to have an, um, a supervisor with you. Um, do you have many? Uh, I don't know. I didn't see over there in the web page. Is any institution you are you sort of 
obviously you did not feel cited you said that UN workplace is a disaster um, do you think that um, having these uh, partnerships with different institutions could also help you in regard not just having a database which is great I mean a lot of people do that and it's very um, important to have legislation but also like um, statistical facts for example you, you were commenting on that that you have all the database and uh, jurisdiction um, 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 legal stuff but uh, would you think that expanding to also statistical um, facts like for example in Spain um, it's something that we had I think a couple of, of months ago it is one of the best um, legislative countries um, against LGBT phobia or you know um, all of that but at the same time has the highest um, um, LGTV, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, related crimes as well. So maybe obviously it's a great thing having a database, but what about also having um, these things in order to say it is this legislation, but at the same time you can find yourself that it's not a safe country because obviously looking at the map, you can say, why wow, fantastic country, but then you say in, uh, well, it has the highest rates as well. So um, I don't know if it's been said or I missed that, but um, do you have this um, idea of expansion in order to have um, a, a, a rather complete um, database so that you can compare um, the one, well the second one and the first one, either if you have uh, an um, institutions backing up or supporting your um, um, this project, for instance? Mm, at the moment, I don't, we are not uh, at that point of discussing mainly including statistical data. Of course, that would be amazing. I mean, it's something that uh, I will discuss it with my supervisor to see what idea does he have on that. We developed this focus on the legislation to, to offer that part, but definitely it could be very interesting to partner with universities and centers of studies that are working on that because that could offer a much more complete um, view of, of everything. So far it's not in our plans as far as I know, but we, apart from the database, we are working on other research projects. Uh, try to develop them, of course, again, when there are resources for that, as, as happens in every single organization. Uh, but definitely having a more uh, data based approach in one report can be very, very interesting to, to explore. The only data that we cover now is, as I said before, the the cases that we have confirmed of criminalization, which we, again, have to warn that it's just the tip of the iceberg of the cases that are in reality, because uh, we, we explain in our report, the report is called Our Identities Under Arrest, which is just about that. Um, but again, it, it's not statistical data, it's the data that we have managed to confirm, we put it there to help mainly, as I said, lawyers working with asylum seekers to make a case on how this, the country they're coming from are, is enforcing laws. But definitely in the future, having into account that should be, should be very interesting. So I will, I will raise that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I have a last point, which is actually getting deeper in what uh, has been said now, because uh, to be honest, I'm, I, I mean, the, I, I guess that I mean having these great data sets is great, but I mean, if you are, n if you are not analyzing these data sets, I mean, just providing these data sets to, to, the, to the research community is fine, but I mean, my perception is that uh, uh, you could make a higher impact on policy makers that that is also my question. If you have information, how much impact you have on policymakers uh, at the national and, and um, supranational level? But I mean, r the real impact is when because politicians usually most of the times are quite ignorant, you know. So you have to provide them all this information very, very uh, well, uh, 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 well, uh, process, process all this information properly. Otherwise, they don't. They first they don't look at the data, and second, if they, even if they look. They just don't understand this data, okay? So, uh, and I think it's a pity after doing so much effort that you don't actually make a strong report, just co not only contrasting this data, but also from a multidisciplinary approach, because my perception is that uh, you have a low background, and I, my guess is that uh, um, I miss a little bit of a political science, sociology background here, also history, 
uh, because I think that, that that could be much more appealing uh, uh, these two uh, 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 in, in, in the public sphere and also particularly also oriented to policymakers, okay, because um, having this data, yes, online is great, but would be even greater <laughs> to be able to provide a more uh, uh, sophisticated and elaborated uh, 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 reports, basically putting some uh, really issues on the table and yes, uh, driving the public and the policy making uh, uh, process, okay. I agree, but we're just part, one part of the I engine. Agree, <laughs> but you have to do something more. But, me, yeah. but I mean, Ilga cannot do everything, that's why universities are forced <laughs> to. <laughs> no. I mean, no, we are just one part of the engine. We offer this part of the engine and with that, and the rest, we have to construct the argument. I also, as I said before, I'm involved in all the parts. So when I do something for lobby, for, um, I mean, I've been, the impact that I have, I've been invited to developing policies in the government and, and in the Council of Europe. My partners and the, my colleagues in the UN team also work all the end up, but we're just one part of the engine and we cannot substitute what uh, local activism does. So we offer this, and with this, the rest have to do, all. I mean, it's, it's that we offer one part of the work, just one part of the work, I'm sorry we cannot do all, but um, definitely I think by collaborating with institutions could be uh, a great way of having the most complete picture. But then when we go to, I mean, as an activist now, not as part of the ILGA, when I go to uh, the institutions, I not only go with the data and say, hey, click here and you'll see everything. I go with information and then I will go for all the information. Um, many times what we ask is put some money and find some data because we don't have data on asylum seekers. We don't have enough data on um, how many conversion therapies are being, how many victims of conversion therapies are in Spain, for instance. So we are one part of how to push, but we still need the work of the rest of activists, of the academia, we still need all the parts of the energy, uh, of, the, of the engine, of and all the synergies to work, yeah. Yes, and you have the responsibility to create these synergies with other uh, social uh, actors, uh, but I think you are the main responsible for creating these synergies, because I mean, I, I think IGA would be much more uh, credible and powerful by doing these synergies, okay? So talk to your supervisor and and, <laughs> and tell him all these things, okay? <laughs> we are discussing right now here. Yeah. Oh, sure, of course. However, as I said, we are a federation, so at the end of the day, we respond to our members, which are the local organizations. So, I mean, I imagine if we from Geneva go to a country and say, hey, you should do this that could be not very well received. Now if we go to, maybe if we go to Spain, people won't complain, but if we go to Uruguay, to Central African Republic or Vietnam, they're going to say, hey, why don't you <laughs> do your stuff? So what we do is support the, the efforts of the local organizations well, in that. Now, uh, uh, recent research we have made uh, now, uh, Joel and myself, we, we have discovered that there are strong differences uh, uh, for LGTB people in Spain, depending the uh, autonomous community or the region you are living, okay? Uh, uh, so, uh, nobody said this before, and this is actually ILGA data. What I'm saying with this is that you could actually, uh, uh, well, we did it, but I mean, what I'm saying is that uh, 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 this information which is already in ILGA and nobody's using, almost no one is using, that would be very interesting to, uh, to show policymakers well, how bad they are doing in some, uh, particularly in some parts in Spain, okay? Uh, 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 and this is, well, I think this is the best way to basically to, uh, um, well, how bad and how good, because there are some regions who are actually doing pretty good, okay? So uh, there, there is a lot of vari uh, variation and, and differences across uh, uh, regions in regarding to legislation on uh, LGTB, regarding to education and, well, and on, uh, health issues, other issues as well, okay? So what I'm saying with this is that, um, um, well, it's a pity that all this information is actually, is not used properly because I, I think that the drivers of the policy change is actually, uh, 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 the mechanisms of uh, policy change are pretty much related to this kind of research and you show in a public way and then you, 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 you just say to policymakers and then 
is when something could happen. If you, nobody is doing this, I'm afraid that uh, I mean we are we are not really moving okay into into the right direction. But anyway, this is my view. Uh, okay, more points uh, uh, to uh, to make. So well, many thanks, uh, Kuro, for this great presentation. Okay, and for coming to UPF.